Welcome to Focus on Abilities, a program about issues affecting the lives of people with disabilities. I'm Lex Frieden, your host. I'm Professor of Biomedical Informatics at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, and I direct the ILRU program at Tier Memorial Hermann. We're glad you joined us today. We have a very interesting guest, and we're gonna take a break to come back to the show, but before I let you go here for a second, I wanna ask you a question, one that we'll answer before the end of today's program. What Houston hero started the first research program on women with disabilities in the United States? We'll answer that question before the end of today's program. Please stay tuned for Focus on Abilities. Focus on Abilities is brought to you by Tear Memorial Herman, redefining rehabilitation, removing barriers, re-enabling independence. In the ILRU Southwest ADA Center, promoting compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. You're watching Focus on Abilities, I'm Lex Breeden. We have a very interesting guest today, Peg Nosek, founded the Center for Research on Women with Disabilities. Peg, welcome to Focus on Abilities. Thank you, Lex. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, Peg, I called you a hero, and I really believe you are uh, a heroine. Uh, you were uh, one of the patriots, as uh, our mentor Justin Dart would say, in the movement for equal opportunity for people with disabilities. You yourself uh, achieved uh, goals that you might not have imagined in independent living and, and uh, equal opportunity when you were a child. Uh, Peggy, you grew up in Ohio, right? Yes, that's right. And uh, at the time, you were very disabled. You're, I remember your mom actually literally carried you to a meeting at which I was speaking in, uh, in Ohio, and you were pretty young then. Do you remember that? Oh, my goodness. You remember that. That sure was a long time ago. Yeah. I think I was just a really skinny, hippie kind of kid back then, right? You were indeed. <laughs> With long hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, Ohio is a very old kind of state. I lived in the Cleveland area, and it was built up mostly. At that time, all the buildings were mostly from the early 1900s, and no concept of wheelchair accessibility. And my disabilities from birth, and I wasn't able to walk since I was 11. I had a progressive disability, and uh, my mom just had to carry me everywhere. And my mom and dad were both very insistent that I have every opportunity that every other kid had. And so they carried me to make sure I had equal opportunity. See, that's an important uh, concept for people to understand. I think many people would think about being carried, and they would think that's demeaning, that's uh, uh, really a parent should never carry a, an older child or an adult someplace. And, but on the other hand, your parents saw that as a means to education, as a means to integration, and they were simply dealing with the reality of the environment at that time, right? Yeah, there wasn't any other option. So, well, there was. And the other option is what most kids with that type of condition at the time experience, and that is staying at home or in the hospital. Well, in our view, that wasn't an option. I mean, if I wanted to have an education and eventually work and have my own life, I had to be there with all the other kids. And the only way to achieve that was to have my parents carry me everywhere. And did you graduate from uh, high school with a, uh, the same degree that yes. other kids had at the time? Yes, all the way through I went to regular schools. Yeah. And you were able to ambulate until you were 11 years old. Yes. So when you were in high school, mostly you used a wheelchair. Oh, yes. Did That's the right. school make any accommodations? No. I mean, this was way before way. the Education for Handicapped Children's Act or the ADA. Right, right. We have a 504. If you remember way back, the first civil rights uh, federal law that there ever was for people with yeah. disabilities was called Section 504. And so that, to get into it, that was before even that was passed. That, that, did the other kids in the school help you up and down steps? Oh, yes, or? yeah. Oh, it was a great way to meet boys. <laughs> I like that part. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah, I mean, they, to get, see, I was a musician in those days, and I used to play oboe, and I was in the band and the orchestra, and I had to be carried up the stage, the steps, to get onto the stage, and so the boys always carried me up. Did you get a lot of attention because you were exceptional in the sense that you had a disability? Yeah, I didn't really like that. I mean, I didn't want that kind of attention because it was putting me up on a pedestal. I, I didn't want to be on a pedestal. I really wanted to just be an ordinary girl. So you wanted recognition for the skill at which you portrayed in playing the oboe or doing your schoolwork, not simply because you happened to be a person with a disability who was able to do those things. Yeah, and you know what the worst barrier was? Was in dating. Because the boys, I, they never told me this directly, but they would tell my friends, you know, I really like Peg, but I wouldn't know how to take her out on a date. How would I get her into the car? Because, you know, her mother always picks her up out of the chair. I mean, they, they would never pick me up by my body. They would pick me up in the chair. So I had a manual wheelchair then. I didn't have a power chair. And so they could, they, they could just lift the chair, get a boy in front and a boy in back, and they would lift the chair with me in it. And so how would they get me into a car on a date? I mean, they had no idea. You know, I told them, you know, if you really wanted to, we could work it out. Uh, but they just, they, they saw that as a barrier. And so I really struggled on the social front. So it wasn't until I moved away from home, went to college, and lived in a dorm, and yeah, really got socially integrated that now, dating the, 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 After you graduated from uh, high school, is that when you moved to Texas to, and yeah. started school oh. at UT? No, no. I went to uh, college up in Ohio, and that was even worse than high school. At least my high school was all on one floor. I went to a high school that was in the next suburb, and it was all, because it was all on one floor. And so that was relatively easy, even though the stage yeah, did have some steps. Um, and then I uh, went to, for my bachelor's degree to a conservatory of music there. And then I went to do a master's degree at a, another very old uh, college in the same area of Cleveland. And so I had to be lifted up and down steps all through that as well. So I did a bachelor's and a master's in music up in Ohio. And then when I wanted to go on for a doctorate in music theory, I uh, realized there weren't any programs in the area, so I had to leave home if I wanted to continue my education. And that's when I started looking around all over the country. And the University of Texas looked the most accommodating, and the, it had the best program for what I wanted to study. So yeah. I Peg, came down here. You, you know, it's not like you, in a vacuum, decided that you wanted to be successful in your life. Uh, you came from a family. I mean, I know that at least one of your brothers is uh, intellectually inclined and and a scientist, and and I think I recall your father was too. And so, I mean, you grew up in a family that had high expectations for all the kids, and uh, they didn't compromise on that for you simply because you had a disability. Oh no, not at all. Quite the contrary. No, my father was an engineer for NASA, and my uh, mother was a nurse. And my brother uh, ended up going to college in biophysics. So yeah, very intellectually oriented family. And my um, father really had a hard time imagining how I was going to live my life without my parents to support me. And he didn't have any concept about how a woman with a disability would ever be married. So his well, per famous particular, line. Per hold that thought a minute, particularly a woman with a disability who imagined herself being a professional musician, right? <laughs> yeah, not exactly the best lucrative profession. <laughs> so so what, what was your father's favorite or famous uh, line? Well, his favorite line was, nobody's ever going to marry you, so you have to succeed with your brain. Wow. Over and over and over, he would tell me that. Every time I got a B instead of an A, there came the line, nobody's ever going to marry you, so you have to succeed with your brain. So this unrelenting push to excel uh, and I mean, be did, superior Did that make you feel academics. bad? I mean, did that leave a, a scar on it your psyche? It was like a knife. It was like a knife in my heart. I mean, your father didn't intend no, to hurt ever. you. 
He was and being, when I was in, in his, my, as an engineer, he thought that was reality you had to live with. Oh, you have to be tough. You have to be tough. Oh, yeah. He, he was very much, I mean, you know, I come from a very Polish family, very Polish family. And, you know, they suffered through the Depression and, you know, some really hard times through immigration and all of that. And so the, the, the uh, ethic was you've got to fight your way and you've just got to survive. And so my father's image of survival was to succeed through education. And so that's how I did it. And so he pushed really, really hard. And it wasn't until I was in my mid-40s that I finally confronted him about that, because he said it again. We were on vacation, and, and you know, he said it again. And I said, Dad, do you have any idea how much that's hurt me every time you've said that to me? And he says, Really? I, he was clueless. He had no concept that he was hurting me when he said that. And he, um, he finally uh, realized it, and he said, you know, I never meant to hurt you. I just want you to succeed. And I, at that point, I was a full professor in the medical school. <laughs> I had finished my doctorate. You know, I was living on my own. I had the hallmarks of success, a car, a credit card, my own house. You know. I mean, what more could you want? I was a success, and yet I was not married. Oh, my. And did he ever rest peacefully with the notion that you were going to be able to manage for yourself? I think so, yes. And it never really bothered him that I wasn't married. But has it bothered you? Yes, very much. But I found other ways. Other ways to? Other ways to find fulfillment. I mean, I've had children in my life now. And so I never had the chance to have children, whether they were mine or adopted, you know, because it's really best to adopt if you do have a partner. But um, I've, I have children in my life who live with me um, through my attendant, Perla. And, they, and the, the children consider you to be mother, granny? They consider me family. And somehow they've opened my heart chakra. It was amazing when the first one came along. I just changed and everybody around me noticed it. They, they said, well, you're different. And I said, well, there's this baby in my life now. And all of a sudden, the nurturing peg has been born. I never felt nurturing. <laughs> I was so career-oriented all my life from that background, you know. I never really learned how to be a woman. But, Peggy, you had a lot of different uh, experiences with various philosophies, uh, as I recall. I mean, at one point, I thought you may be Can't Buddhist. You know at this? another point, uh, <laughs> you celebrated Hindu, uh, Hindu. Hinduism. Yeah. Uh, is this just a soul searching for... Uh, another connection or, uh, you know, oh, no, a, a hippie a... looking for nirvana? <laughs> or, what was all that? Yeah, I'm a hippie. Oh, once and always a hippie. Um, no, I, I grew up as a Polish Catholic, and Polish Catholics are very mystical, so that's just part of my blood. And so you just experimented in a way with different, or learned about, experiment is probably not a good word, no, but... just it, learned where I fit. Yeah. And got very fulfilled by that. That's right. And in the process, you learned about and practiced several different kinds you know, of yoga. And that really helped a lot with adjustment, with finding fulfillment, and seeing my own value. Okay. We want to talk more about how you've been able to share your philosophy and, and uh, your imagination and uh, what you've learned with others through the crowd program. But uh, we're going to take a break right now. You all, please stay tuned. We'll be back more with Peg Nosek right after this break. I know you won't want to miss the next segment. Uh, thanks for watching. Welcome back to Focus on Abilities. We're here today with Peg Nosek. And Peg, you founded a program called CROWD, means the Center for Research on Women with Disabilities, what exactly does CROWD do? 
Crown is a research organization within Baylor College of Medicine. We're part of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and we do research projects about how women with disabilities can improve their health and find fulfillment in life in various ways. So it's uh, pretty I mean, comprehensive, but always from the women's point of view. To some extent, the research you do is kind of a reflection of your own discovery process, is it not? Very. Very, very much, yeah. It's, I mean, my research has followed my life. <laughs> I know you've, you know, the research you've done and published. People read it all over the world. I know I've seen it in journals. Um, it, it deals with fitness and health mm -hmm. of women with disabilities and, and really acknowledges there are disparities in health care between women with disabilities. I think the latest data I saw suggests that uh, two-thirds of women with disabilities don't have pap smears. Uh, compared to only one third of women without disabilities. I mean, these mammograms, the, the data are similar. Women with disabilities don't get appropriate uh, care. And that's because they have disabilities, because uh, the environment's not ready for them. The, Mostly the, because of the environment. Is it the physical access part? Yes, it is. The biggest reason why we don't get well woman care, if you can believe this, is because of the lack of adjustable height exam tables in doctor's offices. But, Peg, there's also a prejudice, uh, I think, uh, and that is um, some physicians might wonder, or clinicians, not all physicians, might even doubt that, well, woman care would be of benefit to anybody who has a disability, who's already, quote, broken, who <laughs> may have a limited lifespan for other reasons and so oh, on. I mean, do you, you so hear about that, right? To bring up that stereotype. That's all we hear. I mean, over and over we hear these, these women uh, telling us about their frustrations, their in encounter with these barriers, these attitudes, and it just drives us crazy. I mean, they experience it, it really de demoralizes them, and we try to boost their spirits by saying, well, let's work together to try to change these attitudes, live the, the, the truth and put the truth to, you know, to, to this situation, which is you are a woman, and you have needs, just like every other woman has, needs for well-woman care, and so well, we need to change this. So, so it's a much, as sometimes as much attitude issue for the people with disabilities, the women with disabilities, that, mm -hmm. uh, who from youth are told this, just some ways like your father told you, you'd never be married. They're told they you know, don't have to worry about certain conditions because they won't live, live long enough to experience them anyway, right? Yes, that's right. I thought I was going to die when I was 20, and now I'm 61. If you can believe that, I can't believe it. Every day I think, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm this old. I look in the mirror, I have gray hair, so I dye it in purple so that I <laughs> have something more interesting to look at. But I mean, it's like, I'm not prepared to be, you know, to go through menopause. I, nobody ever taught me about menopause because I was never expected to live long enough to go through menopause. Exactly. So, uh, Peg, in addition to health and fitness, uh, I know your program has published uh, materials about human sexuality and women with disabilities, yes. very advanced stuff that's being used in, in uh, curriculum all over the world. Um, in addition to those issues, what other kinds of topics in general? Yes, we, we have all of that freely available on our website. Oh, we have a lot about um, the Well Woman Exam, about um, uh, health promotion is our focus right now. We're doing a lot about weight management. Uh, again, as I get older, weight becomes an issue, and so I'm interested in how can people who can't exercise lose weight? And that's a, a problem because as you know, um, weight is a matter of balancing the energy you take in and the energy you expend. And so if you can't exercise to burn up calories, how can you modify what you eat so that you don't gain weight, especially as your metabolism changes? So we're putting more and more things up on our website now about that. Well, now, and speaking as a relatively trim gentleman, 
Uh, how, uh -huh. how, what, what, what do you advise about weight <laughs> loss uh, for a person using a wheelchair? Oh, my advice is to just watch the quality of the foods that you eat to eat, uh, you know, stay away from processed foods, foods that have, have got a lot of artificial ingredients. If you can't pronounce it, don't eat it, <laughs> pretty much. And, and watch and, calories? I yeah. Mean, is that part well, of it? Well, you should, because anything that's going to have too many fats or empty fats and sugars, um, again, you know, like just like a potato chips, that's pretty much the icon of the foods you should stay away from. Just highly processed, empty calories, the, the fats that don't do you any good. But there take, are fats uh, that do you a lot of good, like avocados are fabulous fats. I don't like Avocados. Oh, avocados. Avocados. Uh, sweet potatoes, we can leave those off the menu, but I'm sure there are. Sweet potatoes are. are I'm sure there are, <laughs> are other healthy substitutes I would enjoy. Okay, that's good. Peg the. Uh, uh, and move. The, that's the other What about thing. the Just intellectual? Move around a lot. The intellectual exercises we do doesn't help you lose uh, weight. It doesn't burn calories, I'm afraid. Even though you might feel exhausted at the end of it. <laughs> Afraid it doesn't burn calories. Actually, you know, the very best uh, uh, energy expenditure activity is sex. So, well, yeah, if you can you like know, a really make a vigorous note of that. sex, no. make a note of that, please discuss it with your wife. But uh, yeah, I mean, really, the message is just to, to move. To, well, to be and, and also I think to exercise your heart, isn't that part of it? Yes, the... anything that's going to make you breathe faster, uh, get your heart rate up. I mean, really, I'm fine. When I go and take my dog out for a walk, my streets in my neighborhood are pretty bumpy. And so just going over those bumps, trying to keep my balance in the chair, that takes a lot of my energy. And especially so, if I'm with, with my kids and, you know, they're racing around and I, I'm wheeling around in a circle. Circles trying to keep track of where they are and making sure they're not running over each other, yeah, that kind of thing. That that gets me. Uh, I can feel my circulation improve okay. when I do that, yeah. and that's always good. You're burning calories when you improve it. your circulation, so that that for me is good. I, I can't do aerobic exercise. I can't go out to a gym and lift weights. So just moving around, being active, not sitting at the computer hour after hour. Peg, you have a lot of information, as you said, on your website. Yes. Can, can you give us the link to the website so people can go there and yes. learn more? Certainly. Well, we're with Baylor College of Medicine. So the first part of our website is that abbreviation, which is BCM for Baylor College of Medicine. So it's bcm.edu slash crowd. C-R-O-W-D, which stands for a Center for Research on Women with Disabilities. Okay, it works the same if you put www in front mm -hmm. of the dot. Yes. bcm.edu slash crowd. Uh -huh. And uh, plenty of information there. Lots. I know I've been there recently. Yeah. Uh, it's helpful information, and not just for women with disabilities. I think anyone with a disability, family member, oh, uh, yes. particularly clinicians, people practicing medicine yes. and, and uh, educators as well can all learn from yes. that very rich website. And we have a lot of links to other organizations too. Peg, first of all, I, I just want the audience to know that in the introduction I said what uh, Houston Hero established a nationally known research center for women with disabilities. Obviously that's that's you, Dr. Uh, Peg Nosek. And, and I'm proud that uh, you actually worked with us at ILRU for a period of time after your, uh, what I would call a internship with one very famous disability rights advocate, Justin Dart Jr. Yes. Now, while you were a student at the University of Texas in Austin, uh, you met uh, Mr. Dart. And at the time, I think he was uh, the chairman of the Governor's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities, or perhaps the task force on disabilities that the state legislature had appointed. Yes. I was a member of that group at the time, and you actually were invited by Mr. Dart to take residence in his home yes. along with some of his children, of which he had many, <laughs> and, uh, and you learned there uh, basically from the guru. Yes. 
That's right. Actually, my, my introduction to Justin went, went before that because I was uh, the director of the Independent Living Center in Austin, and he was on the board of directors, and that's how I first met him. And I went off from there to do a civil rights project for a year, and that project, the funding ended, and he invited me to come back to Austin and work for him and live with him and his family and work as his assistant. So we wrote papers and planned rallies and did all kinds of advocacy and policy work for people with disabilities in Texas. So I guess that was a formative experience in yes, your life. In the 80s, early, early 80s. Yeah, he is the one who encouraged me to go back to school and uh, pursue a degree in rehabilitation. He said I, I had an academic mind <laughs> and a research-oriented, inquiring mind. Well, I'm also great that. grateful to him because I think he encouraged you to come to work in Houston yes. when I offered you a job. So You offered it to me. You got me down here to Houston. Mm -hmm. I'm forever grateful to you for that. And you've stayed ever since. And, Peg, you've contributed so much to our community. One question I need to ask you before we end the program, that is you use a tracheotomy. Yes. You're obviously breathing with the assistance of a machine. Uh -huh. How long have you used that, and what's the cause of that? It's been 12 years already. Um, my d disability, which is spinal muscular atrophy, is progressive, so um, it gets worse over time. And the muscles that help me breathe were getting weaker and weaker. And I ended up getting pneumonia, was in the hospital, and I, my lungs just stopped working while I was in the hospital and was so congested that I couldn't cough, I couldn't breathe, so they rushed me into the uh, operating room and did a trach to cut the hole in my throat so they could insert the tube and have the machine breathe for me. And wow, when I woke up from that, I thought, oh my goodness, I've got oxygen so you, getting you, to my brain. It's wonderful. So, so it was better actually after the trip than before. Better. Peg, Much it, better. you obviously have a very interesting background, interesting philosophy about life, and as you said, you're more than 60 years old. You weren't expected to live beyond the time you were probably 21, and uh, <laughs> in that sense, I suppose people would consider it a miracle that you're here with us, and I consider it a blessing that uh, you have the opportunity to contribute to the literature on disability, to the thought process on disability, and benefit the lives of so many people with disabilities, particularly women and young women. Uh, Peg, if people want to learn more about you, I assume they can also go to the vcm.edu slash crowd website. Yes, that's the best way to reach us, and uh, you can find our email there, too, and I welcome questions. Okay. Thanks so much for being our guest on Focus on Abilities you, today. Lex. It's been a wonderful program. Thank all of you for watching Focus on Abilities. I'm Lex Green, your host. I want to thank our sponsors and HTV for bringing this program to you, and we hope that you'll join us next time for more Focus on Abilities. Have a great day. Focus on Abilities is brought to you by Tier Memorial Herman, redefining rehabilitation, removing barriers, re-enabling independence. In the ILRU Southwest ADA Center, promoting compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act.